Turn with me today to Deuteronomy. We are going to look at chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Deuteronomy 1, 5 through 8. How many of y'all are tired of getting uh, political mail in your... Oh, that hand went up really fast. Really fast. I think I probably have gotten a tree's worth of, of uh, political things. You know, politics are always in the news right now, always in our mail. Can't run away from it in any way. <laughs> What's that? Good kindling. Good kindling. But you know, in politics, we always hear promises about change, don't we? Promises about hope. Promises about progress. Progress. You know, if we're saying that we won't progress, we're saying that things are not quite right as they are, right? I mean, that's why you have change. You say the progress, you're going somewhere. There's a destination. There's something you're trying to change. But why do we need progress? You know, if you look at the world, look at our nation. Why do we hurt each other? Why do we hurt each other? Why do we kill unborn children in the womb? Why do we destroy the earth? Why do we have all these culture wars? You know, biblically, we have an answer for why these things are happening. It's sin. I mean, it's a very easy answer. It is sin, the reason that we're having any kind of commotion. We need change. And, you know, we ask ourselves, where is our country going? We are involved in elections. We pray for our leaders. But where is our country going? But even more important than that, where are you going? As an individual, where are you going? Because no matter who the president is, you're always going to be responsible for who you are as an individual before God. No matter what's going on in the world, you are always responsible. We seek progress. And to seek progress, we have a real destination as Christians, don't we? It's not some kind of uh, feelings or emotions that we're trying to change things. No, we have a particular destination. It's to be like Christ. It's to be in heaven one day. And that's who we should be pro pro progressing towards, is being more like Christ all the time. In Deuteronomy that we're going to look at today... After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses was giving his farewell address. So Deuteronomy is basically like a sermon. And with that sermon, he's, he's preparing them for entering the progress uh, to the promised land, which is progress. So in Deuteronomy 1, 5 through 8, it says, On this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey. And go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowland, in the south and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites, into Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I pray that you help us to look at this passage about Israel as they prepared to look at the promised land, as they reviewed what it, you had done in their lives. And I pray that you help us to see clearly what our destination is, Lord. Help us not to be wrapped up by the things of the world, Lord, but have a clear understanding of who you are and who we are in you, Lord. Continue to make us more like you. And I pray that you help us to, to serve you wherever we are and in all that we do. Allow your word to speak to our hearts today, Lord, and allow us to empower us to act, to respond to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So Deuteronomy 1, 5 through 8. Moses is given his farewell address to God's chosen people. You know, the law that had been given to the Jewish people, they were God's chosen people. And the law specifically told them how to live. How to live. How to really function in the society that they were going into. We have laws. We have lots of laws. And they were going to have laws too. And they also showed them how to please God. How to be holy. That's what the law was instructing them in. And you know, wherever you go in the world, there's always some kind of cultural expectations, aren't they? There are certain things that you do that are appropriate in different cultures. You think about even in the South. We say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, don't we? If we're being nice. <laughs> But some other parts of the United States, if you say that, it's kind of like an insult. Do you realize that? So, I mean, there's cultural expectations. We don't think anything about holding the door or saying yes, ma'am, or, or yes, sir. And there's cultural expectations for the Jewish people. That's the law showing them how they were supposed to live. Because they were a people of God. 
As Christians, there's cultural expectations from God of how we are to live. We are to be different than this world. And we're to be like Christ. And you know, Moses opens this up and it says he began to explain the law. But if you look in the book of Deuteronomy, it's not until probably about the fourth chapter where he actually starts explaining the law. So why did it take him so long to get to that point? Well, with a sermon here, he was basically laying the groundwork of why you should obey. Why is it that you're obeying this law? Why is it that God has given you this law? And what have you come from? What is your background? And you know, the number one reason why the Jewish people were to obey God's law, the number one reason we are to seek God's will and everything in our life is because God said so. <laughs> you know, parents, we like to throw that one out, don't we? Because I said so. Well, God is our creator. He's over us as creation. He has right to tell us what to do. And you know what? When he tells us these things to do, it is for our own good. You realize to obey God was going to bring blessings upon Israel. To obey God in your life today is going to bring blessings upon your life. It's true. To be in God's will, you are going to be blessed. So God said so. And God's always with you. You know, that's an encouragement in the law too. Realizing that if you're obedient to him... You understand and you relate to him in a very unique way. You know, oftentimes when we doubt our salvation or have these doubts about God, it's because we have sin in our lives. Truthfully, that's what, what's happening is we become discouraged. And you know, the more that you follow God and you're in line with God in your life, the more assurance you're going to have of your salvation because you're going to know who you are in him. And the Holy Spirit's always prompting us to come back to God. He's with you. But Moses reminded him too that God has saved you. He saved you. He's taken them out of Egypt. He's saving us. He has saved us from our sins. And he's there to protect us. And you know, the salvation of the people of Israel was very real. Very real. You ask them about it. What did they come from? It was slavery. This isn't just some kind of fault that God did. He really brought them out of slavery. They were, enslaved, they were slaves in Egypt. So it was a real reality what salvation was. Concrete. Jesus died for our sins and he died for our real sins concrete sins you know it's not jesus didn't die for opinion jesus didn't die for relative emotions of what morals or fluid morals should be which is what the world talks about isn't it that's their progress is they're saying well this is the way it is now but see when your morals are continually just changing like that you have no real foundation it's that sinking sand that we sing about in the kids song you're going to fall apart because if your morals are different than my morals, these are just opinions. But God's word establishes the truth. And Jesus really did save us from our sins. He really did die on the cross for something very specific. Our sins, not our opinions. It was a reality. And why did you, do you, would you want to go back to sin? What God has saved you from. Why would you want to go back to slavery? And this is what Israel had to be reminded of over and over again. Because you see, as they wandered in the wilderness, they often complained about their situation. Oh, man, you remember in Egypt when we had all those cucumbers? Man, that was good. Here I am in the wilderness. God has saved me from slavery, I know. But, man, those cucumbers. We do that, don't we? We do that. We think about, man, you know, I remember when I used to do this. And I like doing that. And, you know, what? sin will give you pleasure. But it's passing. It's fleeting pleasure. It's never satisfaction in that. We're always looking back, but they had forgotten that God had saved them from slavery. We forget that God has saved us from our sins. We were slaves to sins. And God's guidance of Israel was very real. And I want you to understand that God was guiding Israel even in their disobedience. The Shekinah glory. You may have not heard that word before, but basically it's God's presence as a pillar of fire or a pillar of smoke. So as they were wandering through the wilderness, 40 years, you remember that one generation completely died out before they went into the promised land. But did God stop leading them? He didn't. You see, God is naturally merciful, loving, and he wants the best for us. And he's continually leading Israel, even in their disobedience. He was telling them where to go. And today, God's presence, the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart of every Christian continuing to guide us, even when we're hard-headed, even when we disobey Him and have sin in our lives, God doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He wants to make us more like Christ. That's our destination. That's the progress that we go towards. He's naturally merciful and loving. And where was Israel going? They were going to the promised land. 
In this passage, they were in Moab on the other side of the Jordan. There was Jericho. They see the promised land. It's right ahead of them. It's a real destination. They knew where their progress was going. They knew their destination. And they had to prepare to go into the promised land. And that's part of Moses' sermon. He's reminding them of the disobedience, the things that they had failed in, but reminding them of God's law. And that when they go into the promised land, they are to live by God's law. As Christians, we are to live by what God has commanded us to do, to be more like Christ. And it's not something that's just going to take a lot of effort. It's the Holy Spirit making us more like Christ, drawing us to God, leading us in that direction. Your present location right now is purposeful. God has brought you to this point in your life for some reason. I don't know what it is you're going through exactly right now. There may be things you haven't even shared with your family. That you're struggling with. God has allowed this time. But he's preparing you. He's preparing you to go. Progress. There's a destination for you to be more like Christ. To be in heaven one day. There is a direction that you're going. You're being set apart for holiness. And now may be the time to move. Verse 6. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb. That's also Mount Sinai. Saying, you have dwelt long enough at this mountain. This is interesting when Moses goes back and talks about the history of, of Israel before they go into the promised land. He didn't start in Egypt right here, did he? Why not? What was so important about Mount Sinai, where they were at? They needed to remember that they were a people of the covenant. The fact that God has set them apart and given them the law. You realize he saved them from Egypt before they had the law. Before they had that special covenant relationship through the law. And Christ died on the cross for our sins before we ever came to Christ, didn't he? Long ago. You know, that's why we can understand that Christ has died for our sins, past, present, and future, because he died long ago for our sins. He knew exactly who we are and what we would do. Everything in that. Remember that you are a special people, that God has called you out and away from sin. So they start there at Mount Sinai. But you know, the purpose for Israel was always progression. It was to move forward. It was to be more of God's people. It was to go into the promised land. It was to be God's witness nation in all the world. Progress. Go out. And you know, as Christians, we are told to go out. That's what the Great Commission says, isn't it? Go into all the nations, making disciples. But we're so comfortable staying at Mount Sinai. We're so comfortable staying in Egypt eating our cucumbers. We're so comfortable with our situation that we don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to go. But God said, you're done here. Go. That was his command to Israel. It's time to move forward. And Mount Horeb was the beginning of their journeys. And Moses goes through and talks about many times they did fail. But now they're prom really preparing to go right into the promised land. This is the 40 years later. So how do we know when to move? How do we know when to go forward in our lives. You know, that's a question that we have because we don't have God speaking out of the mountain. We don't have Moses speaking directly to us and giving us the direction. So how do we know when God's speaking to us? How do we know when God says move, progress, move forward? Well, actually, we do kind of have God speaking to us out of the mountain through his word. We do have Moses speaking to us through his word. The Bible is so foundational for what we believe and what God wants in our life. And it will bring clarity to your situation. Filter everything through the Bible. Everything through the Bible as a Christian. God will speak to you through his word. God speaks to you through others. This church body of believers coming together. You probably can stop and think about people in your life that have spoken life into you and helped you and given you wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom in this church. A lot of wisdom. God has a purpose and he's going to speak to you. He also speaks to us with circumstances, doesn't he? He opens and closes doors. How many times has there been a door before you and you're like, I'm going and as soon as you get there, it's locked. That happens in our lives. God opens and closes doors for purposes. Where you are right now is for a purpose. But when that door opens, you better be ready to go. You better be ready to go. Pray about your decisions. Pray. When you feel God leading you, pray to seek his will. But, and this is a big but here, a big but. You've got to always take a faith step. Anytime you hear God speaking to you and you know that he's wanting you to do something, it's always a faith step. 
You don't have all the answers. You don't know what the outcome is going to be completely. It is always a faith step. I like to say it like this. It's time to get out of the boat. That's that faith step. Think about when Peter saw Jesus walking in the water. What did he say? Lord, can I come to you? He says, sure. And you think about Peter being a fisherman. He looks down at that water out of the boat. He knows what water is. What usually happens when you step out of a boat? You're going to go down. You're going to sink. Peter had to have faith to step out of that boat, to start going towards Christ. And anytime we have decisions in our life, choices to make, we've got to decide if we're going to step out of that boat. We're going to have to decide if we trust our own intuition, our own thoughts, or if we trust what God is telling us to do. And you see, Peter walked out. He did have the faith to step out of the boat, and he walked. But then he looked at the turmoil around him, and he started to sink. But I love that story because he didn't drown, did he? Jesus was right there with him. And sometimes we're going to make missteps, but Jesus is always going to be right there with us, reaching out to grab us as we try, or we're starting to sink down. But it's always a faith step to be obedient to God. And there is a specific destination that Israel had before them. It was the promised land. God detailed it here in verse 7 and many other passages. The promised land, that's exactly where you're going. And we know that we're exactly where we're going as Christians. It's to be more like Christ. Wiping away all those sinful attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors. And we're becoming more and more like Christ our entire life. And that does not stop in your life. No matter how old you ever get in this lifetime, it's never going to stop. There's always something more to be like Christ. It's a progression. It's moving forward. Always moving forward. So God had called Israel to move. They had called them to do something, to do work, to prepare. What is God saying to you? Has he told you to go? Has he told you to work? But are you like Israel? Do you remember when they first got to the promised land, they sent out the spies. And they were afraid, weren't they? They heard about the giants that were out there. God had already told them he was going to give them the promised land. But there's giants. That's a faith step. And you know, whatever God's telling you to do right now, there's a giant. There's giants out there. There's something that is just so intimidating to you that is bringing great fear into your life. But are you going to go out there and trust God? You remember when David faced Goliath, that giant? That was faith. He said, this battle is God's battle. And that's the same thing with all the giants as we walk into the land, into that promised land. As we walk to being more like Christ, it's not going to always be easy. It's taking up a cross and following Him. It's sacrificial obedience to Him. You know, it's so easy to be selfish. And we don't want to sacrifice. Israel had been comfortable in Egypt. They had been comfortable in Mount Sinai. They didn't want to go on. How many of y'all like change? Do y'all like moving? Changing jobs? Those things are not fun, are they? They're not. It's not things we want to do. But sometimes God calls us to do those things. You know, what is he calling you to do? Maybe it is salvation. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus for your salvation. That's the first step of obedience. It's the first step of faith. Or maybe it is that he's calling you to serve in church in some capacity. There's a lot of different roles in the church. Maybe there's something in the church that God has called you to serve in that doesn't even exist yet. What is God doing? Is he speaking to you? You know, we've got a lot of open positions in the church right now. We need a leader for the WMU. There's various Sunday school classes that need leaders in there. There's lots of opportunities to serve. What is God telling you? Maybe he's telling you to witness to somebody very particular in life. Who's that one person in your life, that circle of influence you know would listen to you? And God's been prompting you to talk to that person. Are you going to do it? Are you going to be obedient? Are you going to take that faith step? Maybe God's calling you to start a Bible study at your home. There's so many ways, so many things. God is speaking to us and he wants us to make progression, to move forward. On a personal note, Little Stevens Creek, when I was called here in January, I lived, I grew up in Joanna, which is only an hour from Edgefield. I had never been to Edgefield, didn't really know where Edgefield was. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Whenever I was called into ministry, which is, I think, about two years before I came to this church, God was doing a lot in preparing me. He was doing a lot. To prepare me for this time. But I was ready just to get a church. But I wanted it in Greer. I didn't have to move, you know. It'd be easy. Your family's right there. It'd been very easy to just make that transition. 
I'm tired of my old job. Just step in and be a pastor. Well, God's called me to. But that was selfish of me. It was. And you know what? I had opportunities to preach at other churches there, but there was never an opportunity to lead a church. And, you know, you get discouraged when you keep trying to go through these doors that God doesn't want you to go through. God closes them and God opens the door. God opened the door for me here. I had not applied for this position. God connected all the dots and he opened the door. I had to get out of the boat. And that's exactly what Beth and I prayed about with this. We knew that if we did not go, if we did not sacrifice our house, sacrifice the comforts that we had of the familiar, of the cucumbers we had in Egypt, we were going to be disobedient. And God said, get out of that boat and walk. And he called me here. And this is nothing to boast of myself in any way. It's to God be the glory. You see, God is working all around you. Are you paying attention? Are you paying attention to those doors that he is opening for you? You can see where God's working in, in your life. Maybe God has spoken to you about a particular type of Bible study to lead. And then you hear from somebody that says, you know, I'm really struggling with this right now. And that's exactly the Bible study that you felt God was calling you to. You see, God connects all these dots. We just need to listen. We need to have our eyes wide open as we serve him. And sometimes he is going to ask you to sacrifice things. When he says to take up your cross and follow him, that image is probably a little bit lost on us today. But they understood what it was in the first century when they said, take up your cross and follow me. You're going to die. You're going to suffer. And that's exactly what God has called us to do. To serve him is to take up that cross. There are things in our life that we need to sacrifice on that destination, on that journey, on that progression to being like Christ. And don't fear failure. There are going to be missteps in your life. Sometimes you are going to make the wrong choice. You think it was God's will, but God's going to close that door. But all of it is for training. Where you're at right now, God's using it for training, for a purpose in your life. But God has been given us so many great promises of this progression, of where we're going. Look at verse 8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them their descendants after them. You see that? The Lord had set the land before them. He has set something before you right now. There's something that God is wanting you to do that you're not, you have not done yet. But he set it before you, that destination there. You realize that success, salvation, sanctification, that is being made more like Christ, is all dependent upon God. It's not dependent upon you. You just have to be obedient. You have to trust him with faith. You've probably heard it said before that God's never going to ask you to do something you can't do. You've heard that before, right? Is that true? I don't know that that's biblical. Do you think Moses was able to, to bring all of Israel out of Egypt on his own? No. Do you think David was going to be able to defeat that giant on his own? No. God is going to call you to do things you can't do. And it brings glory to God's name when he sees the people working. The people working. Because God always works through imperfect people because there are no perfect people. We are all sinners saved by grace. He's always going to work through imperfect people. 1789, this church was founded. And I can guarantee you, it was by imperfect people. It was by people that had many shortcomings. The Southern Baptist Church and its founding had many shortcomings. But you know what? We see God's faithfulness, don't we? Here we are in 2020 gathering in his house to worship. That's God. That is to God's glory. It's not those people. It's those people that were being obedient to what God was already going to do. We just had to get into his plan. We had to get into where he was sending us. God did it. So are you opening your eyes to God's promises? Think about Abraham. Long, long ago, he told Abraham that he was going to have many descendants. Many descendants. That he was going to have the promised land. And that all nations were going to be blessed through him. So here's this many descendants. They're standing on the other side of the Jordan River. There's that promised land. Now how were all nations blessed through Israel, through Abraham? It's by Jesus, the Messiah, who came to die for the sins of the world. He came. Jesus, fully human, fully God, who took the punishment for our real sins on the cross. And God has promised that if you come to Christ, that you have salvation, that you have heaven waiting, that you have forgiveness of sins in Jesus. Do not forget God's precious promises to us. And everything that God does, He's going to finish. He's going to keep you. And one day, 
It's going to be finished. Glorification when you have that new body. When you're no longer sick. You no longer die. You no longer suffer. You no longer have sin. God is going to do it. See, Israel was a special chosen people that were to be God's witness nation. And the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came through the Jewish people. We are special people. God has called us. And God has a purpose for us. To move. To make progression. Where are you going? You know, you've heard before too. When God tells you to come to the altar for salvation. Or wherever it is that God has spoken to your heart and says, You're a sinner. You need Jesus Christ or you're going to go to hell. You're separated from God for sin. You know, God will take you as you are. You're not going to get your life in order before you come to Christ. He's going to take you where you are, but He's not going to leave you there. That's true progression. Being more like Christ. He's not going to leave us in those same sins that Jesus died for. He's making us into a new creation. We need change. This country needs change. We need progress. But there is a real destination. It is to be like Christ. It is to be in heaven one day. A real destination. So today you've got to ask yourself, where are you headed? Where are you headed in your life? And are you ready to move? When God opens that door, are you ready to serve Him? Are you ready to take up that cross? Are you ready to move and give God the glory for all that He does? Today He's speaking to your heart in some manner. Maybe He is calling you to salvation. That you have never come to Christ. The fact that Jesus died for your sins... All you have to do is accept them. Believe. Confess your sins. Turn away from them and follow God. Salvation. And maybe He's calling you to work in the church. There's something specific that He wants you to do in church. Is there some kind of new ministry that He's even spoken to your heart over and over and over again, but you keep saying, well, that's not in my church. Uh, you know, I don't have time for that. Are you doing it? Or are you going to, to move? And maybe you're a Christian today that is dealing with some kind of sin in your life. That you have not repented of yet. That you're struggling with. Are you going to move? Are you going to make that progression to be like Christ? What does it mean to be like Christ? Merciful. Loving. Forgiving. Sacrificial. And most of all, holy. To be perfect. That is what God has called us to. It's not a lower standard. He's called us to be perfect. We're going to have a moment of silent prayer. If you'd like to come down to pray, like to speak to me after the church, whatever it is that God's speaking to you today, don't ignore His voice. It's time to get out of that boat. Before we close, Lisa had a few words she wanted to share with the church. Come right here, Lisa. I didn't come here to share a few words. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say the whole hey, Lisa. Time, get out of the boat. <laughs> I didn't want to get out of the boat. But anyway, when the pastor started, last week we went to New York, um, and it was a really good time. And I guess what maybe started off in Pastor David's sermon, you know, he started off by saying, you know, we say yes ma'am, no ma'am, all those things. And in other cultures, and sometimes we think that's a good thing. In New York, they don't really think it's a good thing. It's like, I remember being at, um, going to see our friends in New York and hearing them talk about, just let their children say yes ma'am and no ma'am because that's what they're taught to do, but they don't do that. But it, last week when we were up there, we've been friends with our uh, people up there for a very long time. And what makes us all come together is Jesus. And, you know, as Pastor David was preaching today, you know, about God, you know, speaking, and my heart was pounding in my chest, and I really get up here and I don't, I didn't prepare anything. So I hope this makes sense. But when we were up there, you know, and, and Susie, I was sitting by her in church last week and we were singing um, a song and I, about, you know, I grew up watching The Sound of Music. It was a benediction to the hymn of Edelweiss. Just singing that with her. And then sharing with their daughter-in-law, Kelsey, who was from Montana. And she loved Jesus. And we all share Jesus. And... The pastor there last week was from Korea, and you know, um, it, was, it was a Methodist church, and and um, he, I was really in, impressed by his faith. Um, he talked about a story one day when he was in New York. He said we were there, to, um, and I talked to the ladies the other week at our Bible study. He was riding down the road. He went to New York City. He said, "I've been to a pastor's conference, and they, I was driving out of my car in New York City, and." 
this man, he hit me in the back, and he got out of the car, and he's a very big man. He said, he had very long hair, he was Italian, he's mafia. And I said, Lord, don't let this big man hurt me. And um, anyway, so he got in the car, and he said the man was very nice. He said, it was my fault, not yours. Let me, where do I need to take you? And then he asked him, he said, are you a father? And um, he said, I guess he thought I was Catholic. And he said he believed in God and all the saints. And, and the pastor, Kim, he said, I don't really believe you believe in anything, and you don't have to, what you need is Jesus, because Jesus came and he died for you and for me, and we don't have to make any standards, because we all fail, but Jesus did it all, and, and, while he pray, and then that man prayed with him, and he says as they prayed, his teardrops fell on his, on his wrist, and he gave his heart to Jesus, and he woke up, and he opened his eyes, and he said, you are a child of God. And, you know, in this time, in this day that we live in, with COVID and so many people not knowing what to do, all we need is Jesus. Amen. And that's what someone wanted to share. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. God is good. That, that is so true. He, he's on the throne, and all we need is Jesus. I was uh, preparing our devotional thing for, for tonight. It's on YouTube. And talking about the bread of life, you know, the Israelites were provided with manna, bread from heaven. And it was always there, and God was always looking out for them and providing those things. And that's when they complained about not having their cucumbers and their pots of meat that they had in Egypt. They were tired of eating the manna. But if you remember in, I believe it's John, Jesus said that he was the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life, and if you have me, you'll never hunger again. And it's a very different hunger, and it's a very different thing that's being satisfied than, than the things that we have in the world. God is in control, and God is going to sustain us through all things. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your tremendous blessings upon us. I thank you for your tender mercies. And I thank you for the, just the, the testimony of your goodness that we see in, in our lives and lives around us in this church, Lord, and what you have done. And whatever that boat is that we're sitting in right now, Lord, that we would just look to you. Peter sank when he looked at the waves in the storm. You were there to pick him up. But I pray that, that we don't sink, that we walk in faith, and that we just look upon your face, Lord, and trust you in all the things that we are uncertain about and all those things that trouble us and those giants that are before us, Lord, knowing that the battle is yours. I thank you for your love and your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.